All right, let's get to our lesson. I hope you have your Bibles nearby because we're going to look up some scriptures that are not in your handout uh, tonight. But if you have your Bible, we're going to uh, transition uh, to the next storm. Uh, Sister Solomon, are you there? Yes, I am. Could you bring up uh, the song that we've been trying to play <laughs> for two weeks? <laughs> uh -huh. for, those, for those of you who don't, are not familiar with this song, and for those of you who are, like I've, I've heard it for years, but I just want you to listen to the words of the song and uh, listen to it with fresh ears. And when the song is over, I'm gonna give you a little space so that you can comment on what you believe the message of the song uh, is for you. Okay, whenever you're ready. Oh, the storms keep on raging in my life. And sometimes it's hard to tell the night from day. Still that a hope that lies within is reassured as I keep my eyes upon the distant shore. I know you'll hear me safely to that blessed place he has prepared. But if the storm All right. 
All right. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, what is the message in that song for you? I mean, we could we could analyze the song line by line and be here all evening, but what did you get from that? Well, Pastor Ruffin, what I got for that song, that during my lifetime, I had experienced uh, my brother died in uh, November of the 90s, and my, when he died in, when he died, my sister, we picked her up from the cancer hospital. And she went to my mother and asked her why that she had to die. And that was only, he died in November, she died in January. Mm -hmm. And then my cousin that picked my brother up the day that he died, he died in February. Wow. So if my mother didn't have her soul anchored in the Lord, we all been in just a crash, you know. I listened to mama, how she talked to my sister and everything. And uh, when her, her nephew, you know, when he passed away, you know, we mm -hmm. all came together. We never had no one in our close immediate family to die like that. My sister was 40. My brother, he was a twin brother. He was only 47. Wow. So to me, by doing that, by her being anchored in the Lord, it didn't, it affect me where my, where I believe in Jesus Christ as my savior, I had an anchor to hold on to. Oh, we would just, we would fall apart. If you don't have no one nothing okay. but the love of Jesus in you, how can you hold on? What you hold on to? It would right. just slide away. You have no steady okay. in your life to hold on. Okay, so all right. I, that's why it spoke to me. It's a deep, deep feeling within my soul tonight. When all I right. hear that song. Woo! You know but I, I don't know where I would be. I'd just be yeah. like drifting. Yeah. Oh, That's wow. what's happened to you when you don't have an anchor, when you don't have something to stand to hold you up, to keep you going, to speak to you, to touch that soul. Woo. Yeah. Yes. And in the song, he says his anchor is in the word. Yes. He said, I have an anchor, you know, but the word in the word, I have an anchor. And mm -hmm. that's what you hold on to yes. is the, yes. is the, what the word has promised. Mm -hmm. Things I hear in the song is is, is really into two. It, it's really in in uh, two contrasting points of view. One, he begins by saying, you know, you know, he has hope within. He keeps his eye on the distant shore. He knows the Lord is going to lead him through the storm. He's going to get there. Yes. And but then he says, but if the storms don't cease, cease, and if the winds just keep on blowing, even though I know this, but sometimes the storm just keeps coming. Yes, he did. Yeah. Even even if that happens, yes, my yes. soul is anchored in the Lord. In the Lord. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So an important lesson in that song, especially if you never heard the words before, then the title of the song is My Soul is Anchored. So it's just a great song uh, mm -hmm. that really talks about the storm. We've been trying to get that play for two weeks and I finally just decided we're just gonna play it. <laughs> so I hope it I hope it uh, blesses you and it gives you something to think about. Yes uh, it did. Think about Ooh. get a lot of inspiration from song lyrics and so it gives you something to think about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Anybody else have a profound revelation you want to share based on what you got from that song? All right. For me I was gonna say when you, um, I really like that part when it says like the storms keep coming mm -hmm. and no matter what, for me, I got out of it. God is always going to be there. He's always going to be our covering. We can always trust in him no matter what we go through. Mm -hmm. Amen. So even if you know he can deliver, you know, you know what he's promised in the word, but sometimes it seems like the storm just won't stop. Oh, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. Because, you know, and that's part of what we're talking about tonight, because we're going to begin our study tonight talking about God's timing. Mm -hmm. All right. God's timing. So let's go to Matthew 14, beginning at verse 22. And in the handout, we're, we're taking this from the NIV translation. And so I'll read these uh, verses carefully. We just but we won't have time to do the whole thing. So we just start. Uh, with the first uh, few verses, four verses. Matthew 14 and 22. 
immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, some translations say at the fourth watch, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. We'll stop right there. Okay. Now, you know, this, the fact that they said in the, in the 25th verse that he came shortly before dawn, I believe has great significance because it is a specific time frame that mm -hmm. Jesus chose that moment to come walking on the water. Now, we all know, <laughs> we, we all know that uh, understanding how you view time versus how someone else views time is a critical uh, aspect of any relationship mm -hmm. because it just seems to be inevitable in almost every relationship. You have one person uh, who, who views time very strictly. They believe you should be on time, start on time, end on time, be timely. Mm -hmm. And then you've got somebody else in the same household who's like, Amen. you know, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> We get there whenever, we start whenever, and so what's the problem? It's gonna be all right. You know, we've all had that experience where you know, one person is outside waiting, and they waiting, and they waiting, and they and you show up and they said, I've been standing here for 10 minutes mm -hmm. waiting on you. <laughs> what took you so long? Mm -hmm. And the other person say, will say, well, why are you stressing out? I'm here, ain't I? <laughs> Yes, yes. That's mine, Barbara's joke. <laughs> I'm here. You, know that well. <laughs> you see, the, the difference is, and this is one of my favorite topics, is that there's a difference between what we refer to as linear time and cyclic time. And you all probably heard me talk about this. Uh, in the past sometimes, but there are people who believe that time uh, has specific destinations so that you can actually be on time. If you're supposed to be there at 10, 15, uh, then you know, they're watching the clock for 10, 15. And they see, it's like the same as having a clock with numbers on it. That's linear time. And you can look and see when the hand gets on certain numbers so that you know exactly what time it is. And so that person is moving in time. That person is moving on time. They are on time. But if you take that same clock and take all the numbers off <laughs> and the hands are just going around like that, that's how some people see time. Amen. <laughs> so they're looking at the same thing, but no numbers. And so they are moving through time or in time. They're not on time, they are in time. And so that's the fundamental difference between how one person time. is time as lin linear time and the other as cyclic time. So one person is on time, the other person is moving in time or moving through time. So, so the person with the clock with no numbers, whenever they show up, <laughs> it's time. It's right time. <laughs> I'm here, I know. I'm here. You know, so that's the difference. And so the, the, the point of this little analogy is that if time and how we view time, how we use time, whether we waste time or use time effectively and the conflict between two people in a relationship who view time differently, and it seems to always happen, uh, if that's important in our relationship, then it's equally important in our relationship with God to understand the difference between how we see time versus how he sees time. You see, we see time 
in terms of days and years, you know, a beginning and an end, but he sees time and eternally. So where we believe that when we die, that's, that's a point in time, he sees us as it ongoing into eternity. So there is a difference. That's why in, in 2 Peter 3 and 8, it says, beloved, um, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. In other words, his concept of time is very different than ours. And it's interesting to note that the word time uh, appears in scripture more than 700 times between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And that lets us know that, that time is an important aspect of who God is. So it is not only about what he can do, but it's about when he chooses to do it. And mm -hmm. so there are a couple of scriptures that I want to look at tonight. And, and you know, we, can't, we could do a year study on time, <laughs> how God uses time. But just, I want to look at a couple of familiar scriptures uh, and just, just point out a couple of points to you. If we look at Ecclesiastes 3 and 1, everybody know that one? Yes. Everybody, everybody ought to know that one. Thanks Ecclesiastes 3 and 1. We quote it all the time. <laughs> all the time. <laughs> so it says, there is a time for everything. Mm -hmm. and a season mm -hmm. for every activity under the heavens. Mm -hmm. And it's that last word, those last couple of words, under the heavens, <laughs> that really stick out to me. Mm -hmm. Because what it says to me is that the seasons of our life that we go through, the things that happen, if you read the rest of Ecclesiastes 3, you'll see that it says there's a time to be born, there's a time to die, there's a time to plant, there's a time to uproot, all of these things that happen. And these things are inevitable. They will happen throughout in, within the journey of your life. And um, they happen at different points for each of us. But that first verse lets me know that it is all according to God's plan because it's all under heaven. heaven. Okay. So yes, yes, mm -hmm. there is a time for everything mm -hmm. and there is a purpose or there is a season for mm -hmm. every activity, every purpose, but the purpose is under heaven's authority. So when we talk about when things happen, you know, we're always dealing with why this, why me, why now? Mm -hmm. But we understand that that timing is under heaven. Mm -hmm. Well, there he is. That's what he says in Ecclesiastes. Okay. Now let's look at Galatians 6 and 9. In the New Testament, Galatians 6 and 9. And the NIV translation of Galatians 6 and 9 says this, Galatians 6 and 9, let us not become weary in doing good. Some of the King, mm -hmm. King says well-doing, okay, doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Mm -hmm. a loaded verse. It's really packed. So what do you think about that? How would you interpret that? How would you explain the meaning of that verse to someone else? What would you tell them? Just, just break it down and say, because it says, let us not become weary in doing good for at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Uh, the King James Version, I believe says, if we faint not. Don't I think that it means that um, as long as we, you know, that we have to realize that that this life uh, that uh, for us is of but a few days and full of trouble, says the Bible. Mm -hmm. So when we um, that when we go through all of these trials and tribulations and and we are trying to do what is right to do and it seems like nothing is going right, 
-hmm. that we just, God is just, uh, just working. If you'll stay with him, he'll mm -hmm. stay with you. And mm -hmm. at the proper, proper time when we all have to go through these things that have been promised that we would go through, mm -hmm. that if we'll just hang on to him, that everything will work out just fine. According to his timing. According mm -hmm. to his timing. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. According to his timing. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's so important. But we get impatient. We yeah. say trust in the Lord, but then we don't want to wait on his timing. We think oh, our timing okay. is more important Thank than his timing. This is for the lesson. More accurate. Thank more, you. you know, we question his timing. You mm -hmm. know, and, and then, you know, one more, one more passage from uh, Job. <laughs> Good old Job, chapter 14, and verse 13. Mm. And we know, you know, Job is going through Fourth a lot. Job. Job. Job 14. Job. Yeah, 13 and 14. Uh-huh, verse 13 and verse 14. And Job is in the midst of intense, intense suffering, you know, from grief, from his children being killed and economic crises from losing all of his cattle and all of his wealth. And then uh, a health crisis because he has boils and sores and running sores and stuff. And I mean, it's just like everything, every area of his life is in crisis. And even his wife has bailed out on him and his friends are accusing him of being a sinner. And it's just like, it's just like, Everything is coming at him from every direction. And he says in this verse, he says, oh, that you would hide me in the grave. All right. That you would conceal me until your wrath is past. That you would appoint me a set time and remember me. He said, let you take me out of here. Right. Okay. And then he says in the 14th verse, if a man dies, he begins to think a little deeper. Shall he live again? And then he says, all the days of my hard service, I will wait till my change comes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All the days. Praise God. Thank you for the answer. Yeah. You know, and there are so many examples of people just like us uh, in scripture who had a problem with God's timing. They had a problem with it. If, if you ask Mary and Martha. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. Oh, we know Mary. that Jesus, they, you know, Jesus loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus and their brother. And so when, when Jesus was away on, on doing ministry and Lazarus became sick, you know the story. They sent a letter mm -hmm. to Jesus. Or they said, Jesus, the one you love is sick. And Jesus didn't stop what he was doing and run to see about Lazarus. In fact, he waited mm -hmm. for two days mm -hmm. so that by the time he got there, Lazarus was dead and buried and had been buried for four days. So he waited until there was no more hope in the eyes of the people right. for him to be healed. And what did, what, did, what, did, what did Martha say? If you had if been you here. Been, yeah, if you'd been here. If you had showed up on time. Mm -hmm. when I was you, we've been out here waiting for you and you didn't show up and now my brother's dead. Right. Mm -hmm. They had a problem with his timing. And then, you know, I really love the, 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 the account of a man by the name of Jarius, who was a ruler uh, over the Jews. And, and he had a daughter, a 12 year old daughter that was sick. And somehow he still believed that Jesus had the, the authority to heal his daughter because <laughs> he had exhausted everything. Jair Jairus could have sent, you know, some of his soldiers or somebody to go find Jesus, but he went himself, right. fresh through the crowd, found Jesus and said, Jesus, my daughter's sick. I need you to get to my house right away. And while he was talking, the woman with the issue of blood the showed blood. up, <laughs> pressed through the crowd, touched Jesus' hem of his garment, and, uh, and was healed instantly. And Jesus stopped. Yep. He was going towards Jerry's house, and he stopped to talk to this woman, to hear her testimony. And he's just standing there. And I, sometimes I say, now, put yourself in Jairus' place. 
He's you still were upset. But Jesus to go. And now he's standing talking to this other woman. She wasn't even on the program, you know? <laughs> and she just showed up out of nowhere. And, and by the time he finished talking to this woman, somebody came and told Jairus, uh, it's too well, your daughter dead. Your daughter's dead. Mm -hmm. Don't even trouble him anymore. It's all, it's over. And mm -hmm. then, and then, uh, what about the man who lay, was laid at the pool of Bethesda? Yep. 38, 38 years. <laughs> yep. Somebody said he was 38 years old. He had never walked. Right. Mm -hmm. His family had abandoned him at this pool. And you know the story of the mm -hmm. pool. Yes, they said the angel came down once a year, troubled the water, and whoever was in the water first would get healed. Mm -hmm. But he could never get there. He kept trying and trying, but every time he would try, uh, he didn't have anybody to help him, and he couldn't walk. So, you know, he had to, had to roll and crawl, and, and every time somebody got in there before him. Mm -hmm. And after 38 years, Jesus finally showed up. Mm -hmm. And then when Jesus said, said hey, you want to walk? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. But the lesson that we find is that every, each one of these, because when he asked me if we want to walk, he, first thing I said, well, look, I've been here for 38 years. You know, <laughs> everybody gets in before me. Nobody's to help me. You know, and Jesus said, I, I didn't ask you all that. I asked you if you want to walk. And so... Yeah. If you would go back, if we go back and, and look at the conclusion of each of these examples, what we would find is that yes, Jairus' daughter died, but Amen. Jesus brought her back. Amen. So a greater miracle than just healing was his plan to do something bigger, something greater, something more extraordinary than healing her. And so Jairus would say, you know, he didn't come when I wanted him. Mm -hmm. Right on time. But he was right on time. Right on time. But it was his timing. Mm -hmm. The same thing happened with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Yeah. You know, Jesus went to the tomb. Everybody was doubting. Everybody's crying. And he looked up to heaven. He said, Lord, you just, you know, I'm. I'm you see him. <laughs> yeah. You know, I just want these people to believe. Yeah. Yeah. His heart was broken because he loved Lazarus, mm. but he wanted the people to believe. If he had shown up and walked into Lazarus' sick room and said, hey, man, be healed, it would have been news okay. among the family. Yeah. But in a public place at his tomb, after he was four days, the, uh, Martha said, we can't even roll the stone back because he's stinking by now. <laughs> you know, it's worse. Mm. They would say when Lazarus came walking out of that grave and the grave clothes fell off, and the next time we see hear about Lazarus, he's at a banquet having dinner. Having dinner. <laughs> <laughs> they, they would say what? He didn't come when we called him. But he right? was on time. <laughs> but he was on time. Right on time. Right on time. And I guarantee you that man at the pool of Bethesda, even though he hadn't walked for 38 years, when Jesus said, take up your bed and walk. Whoa. Mm -hmm. It was right on time. Mm -hmm. Who's going to argue? He, at least he showed up. <laughs> and when he showed up, he did more than I could ask or even think. And, and you know, Reverend Luffin, uh, in the case of Lazarus, one of the other things about his timing was that he showed up on the fourth day. Yeah. And, and what's significant about that is because there was a portion of people who believed at that time that the soul, the spirit hung around for three days mm -hmm. before it left for all eternity. Right. And so he even stayed long enough to dispel that superstition. You know, <laughs> that fourth day was very significant in that, in that fact that they, they couldn't claim that, oh, he just came and he just brought the soul back. Mm -hmm. No, the soul was supposed to be gone. So... That's that right. You're right. Very Ab important. Absolutely. So we, we, we see there that there was a purpose in his timing. Yeah. And so from all of these examples, we have to take the nugget that's there 
and endeavor to incorporate it into our relationship with the Lord, which is the Lord, I see my vision is limited because I see what's right before me. And I think that it needs to happen right now, but he sees eternally and he knows what the future holds. Yes. And so we have yeah. to say, Lord, I have to trust in your timing. Your timing is not my timing. Your will is not my will, but let your will be done. Mm -hmm. And trust that his timing is, in, as I often say, his timing is impeccable. Because he is the, you know, one of the things I believe Ecclesiastes 3 teaches us is that God is what we, what we refer to as the uh, originator and orchestrator of time. Mm -hmm. He created time. He controls time. You know, because the, the fact that we think we can control time mm -hmm. is an illusion. Mm -hmm. We think we can control time. I'm going to make this happen when I say it's going to happen. And <laughs> anything could happen at any given moment, and yes. it will blow your whole plan. All time right. is in God's hands. We Amen. hold on to yeah. things, we cling to things, Amen. but ultimately, time is in God's hands. And as people of faith, we have to just say, Lord, whenever you show up, mm -hmm. you're right on time. Yes. And yeah. I have to learn how to wait like Job. Mm -hmm until my appointed time, <laughs> we trust in him. Okay. Well, I think also too, is that the Lord is teaching us that his power is not limited to before the storm. I, you know, one of the things I heard, uh, I heard a sermon where they talked about the three Hebrew boys and, mm -hmm. the, and the focus of the sermon was not the fact that they got saved from the fiery furnace, they got saved in the fiery furnace. In the furnace. And for mm -hmm. us, you know, well, that's one of the things that we sometimes think, oh, this is this is a bad thing because now I'm in the storm, I'm going to die. Or you know, it's mm -hmm. all over. I, it's the 11th hour. There's no hope for me. But, you know, I think this these, these uh, scriptures here teaches us the power of God in the time that we think that everything is all over. In the middle of the storm, mm -hmm. God's power is still just as powerful and still just as capable. Because one of the things I like about the story there is that it talks about he comes to them just before dawn. But one of the things was the soldiers hated that time. Yeah. The reason being is because that was the darkest time of the night. That's mm. when you could well, you blowing my you blowing my punchline. <laughs> 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 well, you're, you're right on the money, but you are a step ahead of us. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Just, just put put the truck in neutral. <laughs> <laughs> Don't turn it off. Just uh, put it in park for a minute. Put it in. Yeah. Yeah. Put you own it. Right there. You own right it, there. brother. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Amen. 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 Pre a preacher man. All right. Mm-hmm. Okay, and then we're gonna come back to Reverend Carl in just a second. <laughs> we gotta, I wanna set this, set this up, okay? Because if we go to Mark chapter six, which gives another account of this same storm, but it sets it up in a way that is not set up in Matthew. Because in Mark chapter six, it talks about, beginning like around verse 30, it talks about the feeding of the 5,000. Mm -hmm. And in this account, we find that, that Jesus uh, had sent the disciples out on, on a missionary journey. They were tired and they were, and he wanted to take them away so that they could rest. So they get in a boat and they sail to the shore, but, but the multitude of people saw them depart. And they began to run and walk along the shore, following the direction of the boat. And the Bible says that by the time they docked the boat, there was 5,000 men plus women and children already there waiting on him. So rather than rest, Jesus goes on and he continues to teach. And he teaches all day. And at the end of the day, the disciples tell him, you know, man, it's, it's time 
to stop <laughs> and send these folks home so they can get something to eat. But Jesus challenges, he says, you give them something to eat. And they said, we ain't got nothing to eat. All we got is two little fish and five loaves of bread. And Jesus said, that's enough. And then you know the story, okay? How he, he, he blesses it and, and breaks it. And, and somehow he has them sit in groups of 50 and all of that. And, and everybody was fed miraculously with two fish and five loaves of bread. And in fact, at the end, there were 12 baskets full of leftover fragments one for each of the disciples. So not only did Jesus provide everything that was needed to feed the multitude, but there was a, an abundance left over. So at the end of that, if you can imagine, this long day of teaching and ministering and feeding 5,000 people, you can imagine that everybody was wiped out. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're human. They're not superhuman. They're wiped out. And so it is interesting to note that in the 22nd verse, the first verse of our passage, it says immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat. Oh. And there is, uh, there's another translation, I believe the King James translation, which says that he constrained them, which is a much stronger word. He constrained them to get into the boat. He urged them, he commanded them. He said, you all are getting in the boat. And so we can imagine that if he had to make them, this is just my imagination, that there must have been some kickback, you know? We tired, it's been a long day, it's time to rest. It's not time to get back in that boat. Why can't we just chill out here <laughs> in this deserted place? Cause we need some downtime. We don't want to get back in the boat. Right. You know, some kickback because he made <laughs> them. You know, they could have said, you know, Jesus, cause he said, y'all go, I'm staying. You know, he could they could have said, no, you gonna be out here in this place by yourself. Nobody here to protect you. We don't have no extra boat. How are you going to get back without a boat? This doesn't make sense. This is not the timing. You know, if, if, if you really think we need to go, then it's time for you to get in the boat with us. <laughs> but you can imagine the conversation, right? Because he had to make them. And maybe they, you know, maybe just the fact that they are fishermen, many of them, they were able to look up at the sky and say, you know, the sky don't look too good. It, it, it's, it's not looking good. I know it's the evening and all of that, but I see some clouds over there. And, and I'm telling you, it's, no, it, it's not the right time to, to sail out and be out on the open, open sea when we don't know what the weather's going to do. Why don't we wait until tomorrow when the sky is clear, that makes more sense, and then we will leave. But Jesus made them get into the boat. Now, let me say this. Jesus knew if he looked up and saw, you know, maybe some dark clouds in the sky or whatever, uh, he knew that it was not time for them to stay in that desert place, but it was time for them to go so that they could receive a deeper revelation of what it means to have absolute faith. I'm going to have to leave you with this thought, okay? Because it's, it's almost time, okay? There are two types of storms. Mm -hmm. There's a storm of correction, and there's a storm of perfection. Some storms come to correct us. Some come to perfect us. Now, when Jonah disobeyed, and he got caught up in a storm and ended up being swallowed in the belly of a whale. It was a storm of correction because of his disobedience. Man. But when the disciples were obedient and they got into the boat because Jesus commanded them to do so, mm -hmm. and they ended up in the storm, mm -hmm. it was not a storm of correction. It was a storm of perfection. 
It was an opportunity uh, for God to perfect their faith. So when you are in a storm, you have to ask yourself, is this a storm of correction or a storm of perfection? Is God trying to perfect my faith or is he correcting me because of my disobedience? Either way, the end result is pretty good. Mm -hmm. To be corrected means that he loves you. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we got to get corrected. We, gotta, we end up in a storm because we were disobedient. Mm -hmm. But God's love, just as he did with Jonah, God's love protected him mm -hmm. until he got himself together and could get back to what he was called to do. Yes. Storm of correction. Mm -hmm. But most of us, most of us, mm -hmm. we love God. And we're mm -hmm. trying to live mm -hmm. right and be obedient to his word. Mm -hmm. And, and as, as Douglas Miller said in the song, and, and, and if the, and the storm just keeps on coming. Yeah. Okay. It is a storm of perfection. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's an opportunity mm -hmm. for God to increase your faith, mm -hmm. to increase your understanding, mm -hmm. to give you a revelation of who he is. Yeah. And what he is able to do. Yes. And how he can bring you through and when it looks worse, it is a reminder. Uh, and when we get back to the fourth watch, we're going to pick up there next time. You know, they say it's darkest right before the dawn. Mm -hmm. Fourth watch in 3 a.m. <laughs> the fourth watch. The fourth mm -hmm. watch. Yes. The fourth watch starts at 12 midnight and ends at three o'clock in the morning. That's why it says it was just before dawn. And they've been fighting that storm all night long. And now Jesus has waited until it is the darkest night, darkest time of the night. He could have showed up any time, but he chose that moment because there is a message in his timing for us. Amen. And that gets us back to Reverend Carl, but we out of time. <laughs> so God bless you, uh, uh, Reverend Lewis. You know, we're going to pick up there next time, you know, but it is the point of our first part of this lesson about this particular storm is to put your trust in God's timing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just that yeah. little bit. Because the storm is coming. You don't know when it's going to end. You don't know when he's going to show up. You don't, you know, the disciples couldn't see him. As a matter of fact, when they did see him, they thought he was a ghost. Mm -hmm. You know, which I can imagine if they were already scared, that made them really scared. <laughs> but here he comes. He's on his way. Mm -hmm. But you got to trust that there is a purpose for his timing. Yes. And so just that much is, is enough for me to hold on to, because I tell you, you know, all of us are in a storm, but we just gotta, you know, we, we, you know if we're not in a storm, we know somebody who is. Mm -hmm. and, and the word of encouragement for them is just trust that God's timing is better than our timing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He knows when and he knows why. And all we can do, like as the Bible says, we, we see through a glass dimly. Mm -hmm. But in his timing, we shall see clearly. And that's certainly all yeah. of our testimonies. You know, that we've been through some stuff and we didn't know what was going on or why or when it was yeah. going to end. But when we get to the other side of the storm and we look back, just like Mary and Martha, just like Jairus, just like Job, just like all of them, mm -hmm. we can say, I'm glad how I got he over. up when he did. Yeah, mm -hmm. how I got over. Yeah, because there were some things that needed to be worked out. Yes. In God's yes. time. God's time. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Ooh, I hate to stop, but <laughs> <laughs> we've got to stop. And next week, uh, we will be in the Mount Carmel District meeting. Mm -hmm. And so we will not meet next week, but we will meet the following week. Mm -hmm. And we'll get right back to this point. Amen. And we'll be ready to talk about 
the significance of the fourth watch okay. and, and what that means uh, for those in the military. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Uh, all right. God Amen. bless you all. God bless you all. It has been great. And I'm ex enjoying this study uh, on the storms. And I just pray that God would just continue to reveal what we need to know. Because as they say, uh, you're either coming out of a storm, you're in a storm, or you're getting ready to go through a storm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. You might have a few days of sunny skies, but I guarantee you uh, there's something that's going to come that's going to blow into your life that will challenge your faith. And it may not be you, but it may be somebody close to you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, you got to be ha make sure that your soul is anchored. Yes, 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 yes sir. Yes, yes. yes. Anchored. Amen. Yes, that means, sir. You know, I've got faith. Mm -hmm. I've got determination. I'm going to be steadfast, unmovable, and always abounding. Yes. By the yes. God. Amen. 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 God bless Amen. you. All. We're going to close out in prayer, and then we will see you all in two weeks. Two Heavenly weeks. Father, we thank you for this evening and for all yes. that you are oh, teaching yes. us and how to apply your word to the situations and circumstances, <clears throat> the problems and the challenges and the good days and the bad days that flow through each of our life experiences. Mm -hmm. We thank you, Lord, for our church, for your faithfulness to our church and for your goodness and your grace. Yes. We thank you, Lord, for being mindful of us. Yes. As we heard in our testimonies, you are mindful of us. You are everywhere. You order our steps and you watch over us and we give you the glory. We pray for those in our church family who are grieving right now. Yes. For yes. the loss yes. of their loved one. We pray for Brother Ada, <laughs> Sister Jerome, and for mm -hmm. his son-in-law, John, and for his, his sons <laughs> yes. uh, as they grieve the death of, of uh, Teresa Reese. Lord, we pray for that family that yes. you will sustain them. We know, God, that you are going to do that because we grieve, but we don't grieve as those who have yes. no hope. And we pray for those who are sick and, and who are still struggling with health issues. Yes. Lord, you know mm -hmm. them. You know them by name. You know them by circumstance. And I'm mm -hmm. praying, God, that you will move miraculously in their <laughs> bodies and strengthen them. Give yes. them hope. Give them yes. the courage to just keep okay. living, keep fighting. Because if they are still breathing, you are yeah. not done with oh, them. Yeah. And so we thank you, Lord. And thank we give you the glory. And we pray that you will just continue to teach us and remind us of your word. Yes. Uh, till we meet again. Yes. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless everyone. Amen. Amen. Don't cease. And just in case the wind.